Hey guys, it's good to be here. Like Marty said, my name is Andy and I have the privilege of being here uh, this morning in week three of our series called Blessed. And uh, we've gotten a little bit of an introduction the last couple weeks of what this word means and what this section of scripture looks like. We're going to be in Matthew chapter five. If you have your Bibles or you want to open your app, go ahead and do that right now. We're going to use Matthew five as kind of a launching point to kind of look at some themes that we see throughout the New Testament, but we're going to start there. And this, what Jesus is doing here in Matthew chapter five, for those of you uh, who are familiar, is the Sermon on the Mount. And this specific section is called the Beatitudes, where Jesus is simply describing what the family of God looks like. What does his kingdom look like? What does it, what does it look like and feel like to be a part of God's kingdom? And he's offering something, this word blessed, that in my little brain just means a deep contentment and joy that is not attainable without God. This world does not offer this kind of blessed. It's not a material blessing, it's not a situational blessing, it is a deep soul joy and contentment in God. And so Jesus is laying out what does his kingdom look like? What does it look like to be in our family? And so Matthew 5, 9 says this, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Now, there's two kinds of parts here. There's the blessed are the peacemakers, and then there's the for they shall be called sons of God. And that's why we're going to kind of look at these two things uh, through one lens, and that is what does the family of God look like as peacemakers? Why are we peacemakers? Well, this word peacemakers kind of has in it this underlying idea that there must be a conflict, right? There's got to be a conflict. If we're going to talk about being peacemakers, we have to assume that, hey, there's, okay, so what's the conflict? And that's what we're going to start there. And then we're going to get to how to, how do we deal with conflict as believers? Because I don't know if I, in, in my years on this earth, I've ever seen a time in our world and our culture where we need an alternative to conflict resolution than we do now. We live in a society that seems to have a daily dose of how can I be mad? How can I be offended? Who and and, and when is my next enemy going to tweet something that I disagree with and it's on? Right? We kind of live in this culture of conflict. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of it. And here's why I think I'm tired of it. Because I grew up, uh, no teacher taught me this. My parents didn't teach me this. It was just observation of the world that we live in that there are three lies that we believe about conflict. Number one is that conflict cannot have, it cannot be good in any way. The outcome cannot be good. We'll get to that in a minute. The second uh, assumption that we make is that whoever I'm in conflict with is my opponent. That's another myth we believe, right? We live in a world that if we don't agree, then we are, we are at odds. We can't possibly have a relationship. You can't possibly love me. And I can't possibly care for you if we disagree. We have bought into that myth. And then thirdly, we believe when it comes to conflict that there are only two options either win at all costs or avoid it completely because it cannot be good unless you win. And so what do we see? We see a culture and a world that we live in, and I'm not saying the church isn't like this. We're some of the worst at this. We're some of the worst. That I'm gonna win, I'm gonna outsmart you, I'm gonna outwit you, I'm gonna outshout you, I'm gonna out-emotion you. And so then we think, well, if, if they're louder and they cry more and they're, they're more heartfelt in their argument, then, well, I guess I lose. Like, we see that in, in my house all the time. That's my wife. We see it all the time. And my, my, my oldest son, the, those of you who are, who are the oldest sibling, you probably feel this, right? Because your younger siblings can seem to cry louder than you. And so a lot of times there's an assumed like, well, you must have done something wrong because the one crying the loudest clearly is in the right and the most offended. And that's kind of where we live. Or the other option is we avoid at all costs any sense of conflict. And rightly so, it's uncomfortable. It feels a little bit icky because we don't really know how do we walk in conflict in a biblical way. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. But in most conflicts, we innately focus on avoiding the situation or defeating our opponent. Rarely do we ever think that there might be a third option. 
And that option I'm going to explain this morning, and I believe is the better option. In fact, this option is actually the option you want. That will result in what you desire. And that is renewed relationships, deeper connection, and a joy and contentment that is not offered by this world. This morning we're going to talk about the family of God and that this family is marked by peace. Because the peacemaker entered our deepest conflict for us. Jesus is not a peacekeeper. There's a big difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Jesus is not a peacekeeper. He left heaven to live on this earth to enter into the greatest conflict that we have, and that is with God. I'm not just making that up. That's what the Bible teaches. So before I kind of get going, I want to lay two ground, ground uh, thoughts. That every one of us, every human being that has ever been birthed needs to come to grips and understanding of. And that is this, number one, the holiness of God. And number two, the sinfulness of man. These two realities are difficult for us to face because it flies in the face of what our culture tells us. You be you. You're good just as you are. Jesus Christ and the cross of Christ says, no, that's not true. We're in conflict. You see, when we understand who God is and catch a glimpse of his majesty, his purity, and his holiness, then we become painfully aware of our own corruption and brokenness. And when that happens, we run to grace. Because we recognize that there's no way that we could ever stand before a holy God apart from grace. And this is why I'm so excited to stand here this morning and talk to you about Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. My first point this morning is that the family of God is marked by peace because our Father is a peacemaker and our Savior is the peacemaker. Right? Our Father is a peacemaker and our Savior is the peacemaker. You see what God's doing here through Jesus is he's doing two things. He's making peace vertically between us and God. But he's also making peace through Christ horizontally with other people. Follow me. If you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians 1. Or you can, they'll be on the screen. Listen to this. It says, for God, in, in verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, Jesus. And through him, Jesus, to reconcile himself, God, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he, God, has reconciled you and me by Christ his physical body through the death, through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Do you see what happened here? God, it says, but now he, the peacemaker, has reconciled you and me by the peacemaker, Christ. You see, God's not a bully looking down just to catch you. It's not who he is. God is a loving God who knows you and sees you. Therefore, he sends a peacemaker to reconcile us to God. That's what Paul's writing to the church in Colossians here. He's not saying, hey, church, you're, you're fine just as you are. No, he's saying, this is what God did. He is a peacemaker. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish. Christ has made us in a right relationship with God. And then secondly, Jesus makes a right relationship horizontally as well. Ephesians 2, 15 through 17 says, for he himself, Jesus is our peace, who has made the two groups, in, in this situation it's Jews and Gentiles, he has made two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace. 
and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, the Gentiles, and peace to those who are near, the Jews. You see, we do this as people, don't we? We pick and choose who's far and who's near. But at the cross of Christ, two things happen. Peace is made between us and God. And he says, you know what? We're going to take all the hostility, all the walls between human beings because of our brokenness, and we're going to break them down at the cross because everyone is welcome at the cross. It doesn't matter how far you've strayed. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you've thought. Everyone is welcome at the cross of Christ. That is where peace, reconciliation, unity, and family happens. One of the most stark examples of this in my life was when I first moved to Oklahoma City. I did not uh, attend crossings. I did not work for crossings, but I went to a church here in town, a uh, much smaller church, and um, one of those churches where you just kind of you know everybody. And I got invited to a men's Bible study at 6 a.m. Uh, I don't remember what day of the week. It was probably Monday, right? Um, 6 a.m. on a Monday. And I got invited, and it was great. The, the pastor was there, and he ended up mentoring me for several years. He married my wife and I, and, and we would just study the Bible together, and these men would get together, and we would just open the scriptures and, and, and start to feed ourselves spiritually. And one of the co-leaders of the group was a local judge. I, don't, I can't remember, it was a long time ago, if he was local or federal or state or whatever. I don't know what, but he was a judge. And he's a great guy, and, and uh, we would study the Bible together, me and some other guys and our pastor and our, our judge co-leader. And one morning, this guy joins the group. And he looked a little bit worse for the wear. Didn't look like he had had a real easy go at it. But he came at 6 a.m., had no idea how he heard about it, who maybe might have invited him, but he joined us. And he was incredibly consistent. And so for the first weeks, he would come and he started to open up a little bit and answer some questions and, and maybe read out loud and that kind of thing. But about two months in, we finally got his story. And this was his story. Two months and three days before, he had been released from prison. And he was just starting his life over again. And so he was looking for a church. And so he found our church and he got into a men's Bible study. And as he shared the story of what he was in for and how long he had been in, all of a sudden our co-leader judge realized I'm the one that put him in prison. And here they are, 6 a.m., in the same room, praying together, studying God's word together because the cross of Christ breaks down the walls that our society likes to build up. I was amazed. I could not believe what I was seeing. You see, the work of Jesus on the cross is the common ground of salvation for both the Jew and the Gentile, for the rich and the poor, the introvert and the extrovert, the Democrat and the Republican, the sick and the healthy and the prominent and the isolated. There is no longer any dividing wall between humanity in Christ. In Jesus, he makes peace here and he makes, makes peace here. All are welcome in God's family. Jesus entered into our, the conflict as a peacemaker and broke down the wall of hostility that we might be united in peace with God and with one another. You see, we're a family of God, marked by peace. Which brings me to my second point, that the family of God is marked by peace because we are called to be peacemakers. We're called to be peacemakers, one, because our, our DNA as Christians, our Father, our Heavenly Father is a peacemaker. He sent Christ. And Jesus, our Savior, made peace for us. And so our family line is a family of peace in two directions, both vertically and horizontally. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20, Paul writes again, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, get this, catch this, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. 
and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his plea through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. St. Corinthians 5.20 says, we are to be peacemakers first with God. And just because we're in a church service, I don't want to assume anything. I don't want to assume that everyone in here has made peace with God. I don't want to assume that anyone in here has said, you know what, it's time to meet for me to come off the throne of my life and for me to bring Jesus and put him in his rightful place. I don't know if that's you. I don't know everyone here. But our first instruction is to be reconciled to God. And then Paul says in 17 verse 9 through 19, old, the old has gone and the new has come. You see, God gives us a new charge when it comes to relationships and conflict. The new way is to make peace. The old way is to avoid, to defeat, to win, to ghost out of the relationship. For those of you who don't know, ghosting is this new term where people have a relationship and something gets awkward or weird and you just stop talking to them, returning text, phone calls, and you just slowly back out of the relationship until it is no more. We avoid. That's the old way. The old way is to win, 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 or avoid, avoid, avoid. But Jesus says the old has gone and the new has come. Stuart Briscoe, the husband of Jill Briscoe, who spoke here a little about a year ago, he wrote a book on the, on the Sermon on the Mount, and he had a great challenge to the church, the Christians. He said, too often we as Christians lack a heartfelt desire for peace. We prefer a mutual coexistence. We lack a heartfelt desire for peace. How can that be? When our heavenly father is a peacemaker and Jesus is the peacemaker, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. This is a family trait. This is a family trait. How can we lack a desire for peace first with God and then one another? You see, as a family of God, we are called to be peacemakers, not agitators. And we live in a world of agitators. Can we just be honest for a second? I don't know if I've ever met one single person in my life that turns on or opens up their social media app and says, you know what? I would like a healthy discussion for someone to offer some new ideas in a way that is a little bit aggressive because I'm ready to change my mind, right? No one does that because we live in a world where we just want to agitate. We just want to throw this out there because mm, you need to hear this. The family of God is not agitators. We're peacemakers. Like we have this phrase around our house and I would imagine many of you guys grew up with this phrase of that's not how we do things in our family. I grew up in a house where that was thrown out there. Typically it was some sort of pop culture fight with my parents, right? I wanted to go see a PG-13 movie or rated R movie before it was appropriately timed and my parents were crazy and they wanted to ruin my social life and so <laughs> they would throw, that's, that's, that may be what they do. But the Rosh Khal family, that's not what we do. And of course, my eyes would roll through the back of my head because for some reason, my parents wanted my social life to go into the gutter, but we would throw that out there. Like, that's not what our family does. And now as a parent, I, I understand. My kids do not, but I get it now. But this is the family of God. That we're to be peacemakers, not agitators. But here's the hard part about being a peacemaker it is almost guaranteed to cost you something because it costs Jesus everything. That's also a part of our family lineage that our savior gave his life. He laid down his rights. He laid down his smartest person in the room mentality. Right, because that's what it's gonna cost us. It's gonna cost us our ego. It's gonna cost us our pride. It's gonna cost us being right. And it's gonna cost us everyone knowing how smart and right we are. Because when we become peacemakers, we put the relationship over being right and being smart and being just. 
justified in our beliefs. So it's probably going to require you to humble yourself and that will cost you something. Because I don't know about you, but I do not wake up humble, kind, and a good listener. I don't. That's not who I am. But in Christ, that's who I'm charged to be. And because of the Holy Spirit, I am now empowered to be that. When I rely and trust on the Holy Spirit, not my own ideas. There's a pastor in Nashville, his name's Scott Sauls. He wrote this, he said, are we known by what we are for, Jesus and people, instead of what we are against? Are we less concerned about defending our rights because Jesus laid down his rights and more concerned about joining Jesus in his mission of loving people, places, and things to life? Have we ever thought that Jesus has a mission and asked ourselves, have I said yes to the mission? Yes, it's easy. When I was a kid, I said yes to salvation like that because I didn't want to go to hell. But have I said yes to the mission of Jesus Christ? Because that's what being a Christian is all about, being part of the family and about the kingdom. And when you live out that mission, when you live out the mission of Christ, you will find yourself blessed. In Philippians 2, 5 through 6, again, Paul writes, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. You see, Christ used his position not as an advantage over others, but to humbly serve, care for, and reconcile us to God. You know, he didn't come to win arguments, he came to win souls. Is that what we're known for? Is that what you are known for? Is that what I'm known for? Winning souls? Because that's the mission of Christ and that's the mission of his church, to be ambassadors of Christ. Are we known for winning souls or winning arguments? Winning souls or winning elections? Winning souls or winning a popularity contest? As children of God, we are invited and called to be peacemakers first with God and then with one another and then to help others make peace with God. So how do we do this? We get the good news of the gospel of Jesus that God has sent his son Jesus to, into the conflict to make us right with God and right with other people. So how do we do this, right? Good luck. We're, we'll see you next Sunday. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to... I wanna give you a couple things that are gonna help start changing how we think, because that's my third point. That the family of God is marked by peace because we think about conflict differently. Because we belong to a different family. Because we live in a world focused on Jesus following Jesus. And so we have to think about conflict differently because Jesus thought about conflict differently. Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it, is, if it is possible, and it is, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Because here's the problem with conflict. We're always waiting for the other person to start. And they're waiting for you to start. And so therefore, conflict never gets resolved in a biblical way. We use a phrase in our house called, we need to go make things right. And here's the hard thing about that process. It requires two things that are very difficult for us. It requires proactiveness and humility. One without the other doesn't work. Because I don't, again, I don't wake up every day proactive. I wake up lazy. And I don't wake up humble, I wake up prideful. I'm right, my thoughts are probably the correct thoughts and they're wrong, right? So social media is made for. But we think about conflict differently. We call it making things right in my house. And so when there's a conflict, and for those of you who don't know me, I've got five children, so there's guaranteed to almost always be a conflict. And so what do we do? We sit and talk. And we say, hey, what happened? And we get the stories. But at a certain point, we say, hey, we love one another. 
enough to humble ourselves and walk across the house and make things right. Guys, our pride says, I'm not walking across the house. They need to walk across the house. Jesus says, no, no, no. They don't need to come to me. I will come to them. Jesus humbled himself to come down here and take care of our biggest conflict. He was proactive and he was humble. And I'll promise you this, it's not always gonna go well, but that's not what Paul says. He doesn't say, hey, go do it, it's gonna go great. He says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So you be proactive. Let us as a church model humility. And what that humility simply looks like oftentimes is owning your 5% or your 70% and saying, you know what, I was wrong this much and I wanna apologize for that. I'm gonna give you, Marty said I did student ministries. One of the things I always talk with parents about is how do I fight with my kid? Because there's a lot of fighting in teenage years if you guys weren't aware. (laughs) And I would always talk to parents and they would have no idea, what do I do? How do I get through to them? They don't listen. Because here in teenagers, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ruin it for you, but here's the tip. It's this, parents, do this. Be proactively humble with your student. They are ready for a fight. Don't fight, make peace. Come in to the conversation and own your part. Explain to them why the decision's made and that you love them and they care for them. Do all that you can as far as it depends on you, to live at peace with everyone. Just because they want a fight doesn't mean you have to take the invitation to get into a fight. Live at peace. So in closing, I wanna give a couple, four things that we need to think about and, and, and we need to think about conflict differently. Number one, we need to see conflict as an opportunity to be a peacemaking endeavor, not a win-lose situation. We need to see conflict as an opportunity to be a peacemaking endeavor, not a win or lose situation. Because here's the the secret sauce for the believer. You have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit is peace. And so you bring the Holy Spirit to the conflict as an opportunity to make peace, not to win or to make someone lose. Secondly, we need to see conflict as an opportunity to glorify God. Colossians 3, 17 says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And when was the last time we thought, I'm gonna enter this conflict to, to Jesus' name? We need to change how we think. The goal isn't always to win or to be right or to show them how smart I am. The goal is to glorify God in this moment. And so we need to see conflict as an opportunity to do just that, to glorify God. If you want to know whether your motivation is to glorify God or not, ask yourself what your motivation is. Is is it to win? Is it to be right or to get back? If it is, that means you want the glory. You want to be right. You want to be justified. Give that to the Lord and say, God, lead me, guide me, help me be humble as I approach this person. Thirdly, see conflict as an opportunity to serve and honor one another. See conflict as an opportunity to serve and honor one another. Romans 12, 10 says, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. And what I love about this this verse, Romans 12, 10, is that it forces us to focus on preserving and serving the relationship. It takes the issue off the table as a, like the main dish is no longer the argument. It's a side dish. We put honoring and serving one another as the main dish. How can I honor you as we walk through this? Because here's the great thing about biblical conflict is it makes the relationship with the person more important than the issue at hand. And it creates value. I had a staff member just last month come to my office, sat down in a chair in my office and said, hey, Andy, I heard that you said this. I was frustrated about it. And so I wanted to come talk to you before I went on vacation and just was mad at you. I was like, whoa, what did you hear that I said? 
But can I be honest with you, as, as hard as that was to hear, man, I was thankful. Because they honored me in coming to my office. They said, our relationship is, mo- is important enough for me to come to you. And we talked, and imagine this, we had a, a mature adult conversation, face to face. I didn't start that conversation, they came to me. And we walked out of that office saying, you know what, I trust you more. You, man, we'll, we'll go to battle. You value me enough. I think sometimes we think conflict will automatically ruin it, but if we do it right, proactively and humbly to God's glory, you will walk out of that conflict more connected and more trusting. And then lastly, we need to see conflict as an opportunity to grow in Christ likeness. We need to see conflict as an opportunity to grow in Christ likeness. Because Jesus did not see our conflict with God as an opportunity to avoid. God said, no, we need to walk into this. We need to renew this and, get it and, and take care of it. I'll give you a newsflash. This was a, a big newsflash for me in my late 20s. God's highest purpose for you is not to make you comfortable, wealthy, or happy. It's not. That's our world's line, is that if God loved you, you would be happy. If God loved you, everything would work out for you. That's not what the Bible says. Romans 8, 28 and 29 says, God will work all things out, even conflict, for the good of those who love him. And if you need any evidence, you just look at the cross on the side of this room. God used that for your good. Didn't feel good. I don't like watching the passion of the Christ. It's t- it, I hate it. But I watch it because I see God taking what I couldn't imagine be the worst thing in the world, and he turned it for our good, our greatest good. And so we need to see conflict as an opportunity to grow in Christ's likeness. Conflict is a great reminder and opportunity to remember we need to rely on God's grace, God's wisdom, and God's power to change and transform. And in doing so, in relying on God to do the thing, to re- reconcile the relationship, we imitate Jesus as he depended on the Father for everything. So I wanna leave you this morning with three encouragements or challenges, whatever, whatever you wanna say. The first one is be reconciled to God. Like I said before, I don't know you. I don't know where you are with this Jesus thing. I don't know what, what you think when we sing songs to this guy named Jesus. But the most important thing you need to hear this morning is that the cross of Christ, you are welcome. He died and was raised for you. Not just me, not just the band, not just the pastors, not just who go to crossings, he died for you. And he mediated and paid for a debt that you could not pay. You know, our prayer team is gonna be down here at the end. Man, if you need to talk to me about this, these are the people to come to. So number one, be reconciled to God. Number two, go and reconcile with that person you've been thinking about for the last 20 minutes. Go and do it. Be humble, be proactive, own your part of the problem and ask for forgiveness and make things right. Because as a Christian, the mark on our family as the kingdom of God is peace. Our father is a peacemaker. Our savior made peace for us. And so now we are free and empowered to go make peace. And then lastly, ask and allow Jesus Christ to transform the way you see and handle conflict. Guys, conflict, it's one of the main reasons relationships die and people leave. Relationships, families, the church, because we don't handle conflict well. We try to win it or avoid it instead of humbly and proactively entering into it. And I think we just need to pray that God would transform some hearts, transform our minds to say, hey, Jesus, you handled my conflict. Help me handle mine. Because surrendered to Christ, we are citizens of a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. We've been given a new identity and a new purpose. Our identity is peace, and our purpose is to be peacemakers. So Crossings, I wanna encourage and challenge you to be the first to be reconciled with God and then be reconciled with one another by honoring one another 
and then start looking around your workplace and your neighborhood and ask yourself, how can I bring other people into this peacemaking process with God? Because that will be eternally significant, not just weekly or daily, eternally significant. Like I said, our prayer team is gonna be down here at the, end, at the front as you leave. Let us pray for you. It would be our joy and honor to pray for you. Let me pray. God, thank you. God, thank you for your grace. God, show us your holiness and show us your grace along with it. That we might come to you humble and grateful and thankful that you have made things right for us with you. God, I pray you give us courage and the humility and the wisdom to go make things right with others, that we would be known as peacemakers. God, that we would be about winning souls, not winning arguments. And that we would do all these things for your glory and for our good. And praising is your name, amen. Guys, have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.